Hello, good morning. So um, this is our, our final morning of this uh, particular set of lectures. Um, and this is actually the lecture which I was going to introduce renuclear therapy. So there's a little bit of an introduction at the beginning about renuclear therapy, and then I'll talk about um, specifically the somatostatins and how we evolved from a, a hospital-based um, system and university-based system to one that was much more commercially um, driven. So it all started with this man here. So who is this man? So this is a picture of a, an American endocrinologist called Saul Hertz. And in the early 1940s, he had uh, an idea that we could use radioactive iodine to look at and possibly treat thyroid disease. Um, and at that time, they had two forms of iodine, not yet produced by reactor as our modern iodine is, but produced by cyclotron. So they had iodine 130 and iodine 131. And in fact, you have more of the 130 than the 131. And um, very early on, he could see that he could use this um, radioactive iodine to treat first of all, benign thyroid disease and then malignant thyroid disease. And here is um, his notebook. This is a copy of his notebook um, of 20 cases of um, patients who had um, hyperthyroidism that were cured by the use of radioiodine. And this was, um, you can see the date on it's March 1946. And then there's the, uh, a newspaper article. In those days, everything was to do with atomic bombs. So it was, it, they didn't make it from atomic bombs. But that, the headline says, local resident uh, discovers cure for goiter through a bomb product. It's like it's sort of, he sort of dug it up in his garden instead of actually worked out what to do. But um, I suppose that's the way that newspapers work. So we're going to talk a little bit about um, guidelines for PRRT, evidence for the use of PRRT, uh, and then obviously uh, the NETA-1 study, which we're now uh, getting towards getting all the final uh, details from, because it needed a sort of eight or nine year follow-up. So what kind of evidence do we have from clinical trials? So the phase one study is a proof of concept, and you try to work out how much you can give maximum tolerated dose. And there's normally about 20 to 30 patients. Then you do a phase two study, and generally this tends to be more than one hospital to try and ensure that you remove some bias. And you're looking at how effective a treatment could be. And then you normally have 50 to 100 patients. Then the final one is the one that's required for sort of drug registration and for reimbursement from various sort of um, sources like either the state or um, through, um, sorry, we've got a ton of people just coming in. Okay, is that working? Yeah. Um, or through insurance companies. They like to have data from a phase three trial. And what you do is you take your new treatment and you compare it to the what's called the standard of care. And depending on the results of the phase two study, you may need between 200 and 1,000 patients. And again, you tend to do it in multiple countries and multiple hospitals. So we know from our imaging side that um, regulated somatostatins localized to nets, normally via the somatostatin 2 receptor. Um, and Obviously, we can use either gamma or, or PET emitters, and then we can change to alphas or betas. At the moment, with PRRT, we're really basically with betas. And that's partly because the response rate is so good with betas, we don't really need to go further. Um, obviously, compared to normal radiotherapy, you reduce the collateral damage because you're not going through so much normal tissue, and you have targeting to the actual tumour. And because each individual patient you image first and then you scan and you treat if they're positive on the scan, this is true personalized or precision medicine. And 
Richard Baum in Germany calls this precision oncology, and that's actually quite a nice term. So these are the easy to remember uh, European Neuroendocrine Tumor uh, Society um, guidelines for the treatment of what they call gastrointestinal pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, which is basically any foregut or hindgut uh, nucleus, um, neuroendocrine tumor that's not uh, a lung carcinoid. And you can see here that there is a, a, a big pro forma, but in fact, it looks complex, but it isn't really. What it is, is that there are um, basically well, what happens is that um, for most patients, you would start off with non-radioactive somatostatins. That's these, the, the two pink boxes here. And then if they don't work or if they stop working, you then head towards PRRT, or if there's no uptake on the scan, you'd have to think of some other treatments such as um, chemotherapy or mTOR inhibitors or something. They did suggest with high um, um, disease load and patients who, were, who weren't particularly well, you might just go straight for the PRRT. Um, and this is very sensible, but not normally approved by, um, at the moment, by the reimbursement people because they feel you should have a trial of the somatostatins first. But most patients who've got progressive disease are going to end up in the PRRT um, box as long as they have a positive um, scan. So when we're treating neuroendocrine tumours, there's some general principles. We need to obviously establish a diagnosis and that's done with pathology. We need to look at the extent of disease, and that's now best done with Gallium 68, Dota Tate, or Dota Talk PET. If you don't have that, you've got the technician Heinic Tate and possibly Indiumocratide as the third level down. The next thing to decide is whether or not the patient is syndromic or non syndromic. So, with syndromic patients, they, they may have the carcinoid syndrome or they may have insulinoma with hyperinsulinemia. Then the symptoms can be the, the main issue. And they can occur when the disease load is very small. So these patients may have much more aggressive treatment early on in their disease to deal with the symptoms. Now, as you know, with the carcinoid syndrome, that you need to have liver metastasis before uh, you will get the syndrome, or you can get it in a lung carcinoid without the um, liver, because the liver normally destroys the serotonin, so it doesn't get into the general circulation. Now, if you can't see those liver metastases on, for example, a digitate scan, but you can see other sites of disease, it's still worth treating because that just means they've got micrometastases, which obviously you still treat with PRRT. For non-syndromic patients, it's a different situation. There you're trying to control the tumor mass uh, and try to stop the tumor mass from killing the patient. So there it's a little bit more like a typical um, cancer. As we talked about first line of treatments, so uh, for most of these patients, they're going to be having somatostatin analogs, such as octretide or landretide, and they may be on those for a decade or so before they need to have PRRT. And that brings us on to the next one, which is the natural history of disease. So <clears throat> you really need to monitor the disease over a minimum of six months to determine if it's growing or if it's stable. And sometimes these patients go from a stable situation to a growth situation. So they need to be on fairly routine, but not necessarily frequent follow-up. So probably the most frequent you'd want to do <clears throat> is a CT scan of sites of known disease every six months uh, with some form of somatostatin analog imaging every 12 months. If you have disease growth, you might want to do that more frequently. And what we normally do would say that we wouldn't treat patients unless they were symptomatic or syndromic, unless we demonstrate tumor growth. <clears throat> you need to talk to the patient about expectation of treatment. The only real way to cure a patient with a neuroendocrine tumor is to remove it surgically. Now, it may be possible to shrink a tumor with PRRT sufficiently, you can then go ahead and do the surgical treatment. But I think you may have to um, ensure that the patient knows that you're unlikely to cure them, but you can control their tumor and they can live a, a normal life for many years. 
quality of life is important because what you want to do is make sure you don't um, cause more uh, symptoms than you're trying to treat. Now, fortunately, with PRRT, this is actually a fairly simple equation because most of these patients, when they present, don't have a particularly good quality of life, and you can make that a lot better. Sometimes it's really important to decide when you're not going to treat and when to stop treatment. And primarily for PRRT, that's if you get disease progression despite treatment. So around about 15 to 20% of patients may not respond to PRRT. So these are the patients that you have to be brave enough and say that you're going to stop treatment. And the other thing, obviously, is that if they have disease which is very stable and not causing symptoms, you may want to delay treatment. So the radiopeptides we used are all based on the somatostatin system. Um, they started off being converted from commercial sources such as landrotide and octrotide. But more recently, then there's been um, these newer versions of octrotate and octronoc. And as I was talking yesterday with the PET imaging, people have been looking at the antagonists, but so far they've not really moved through into um, therapy that there are um, <clears throat> uh, companies now that are interested in um, developing these. So we may see these come through to uh, treatment soon. Normally we use a DOTA linker and then we might use different isotopes. So gallium 68 is off the list, but we should maybe use an imaging um, um, isotope such as indium or gallium 68, and then we've got yttrium 90 and lutetium 177 for therapy. The only one you can't really use is technetium 99M because it doesn't really stick to DOTA. And there you need the Hynek linker. So this is some work that was done by Marion de Jong, who is, uh, works in Rotterdam. And this is, um, was done, in, you can see, in 1998. And um, what she did is she looked at the binding affinity of uh, the different somatostatin analogues compared to native human somatostatin. And she did this with what was available at the time. So lutetium had just arrived at that point. And as you know, when you're looking at affinities, you need the lowest possible number. And you can see here that the somatostatin 2 receptor is the one that's been targeted specifically by these um, artificial ones, whilst the natural one targets all the receptors. And that's good for us because we don't want to target every cell in the body because every cell has somatostatin receptors, but we want the subtype 2 um, target because that's the one that's overexpressed in these neuroendocrine tumors. Then, um, Further work was done. Um, this was using um, looking at the uptake in a um, mouse neuroendocrine tumor model. And this was done initially with indium labeled a somatostat analog because that was what was available. Um, and you can see here that there is uh, the different types there's tototoc, tyrosine toc, tate, tyrosine tate. And you can see that there is. As you get into the more um, the newer types of peptides like the octrotates, you get much better uptake into the tumor. Uh, they all pretty much the same for kidney, and the tumor to kidney ratio again increases with the newer uh, agents. And below was um, a a mouse, and this was just indium um, octrotide, so it's just ordinary high activity indium octrotide. And you can see that panel A, there's a liver full of tumor and um, B, an equivalent um, um, mouse that had been treated and you could clear the, the tumor from the liver. They're clearly not the same mouse because they can't take the liver out twice. <clears throat> so a practical thing is that we need to do proper patient selection. And for that, obviously we're doing the scans. And as I said before, we would be doing various different uh, imaging. And then, um, we're looking at uh, progressive disease on CT or MR or symptoms that are not controlled. Now, the other thing is that we need to look a little bit at performance status. So WHO performance status is, go, is a very simple grading. So naught is perfectly well and four is lying in bed, unable to move. And <clears throat> we would normally treat patients who are either well or just have some issues. By the time 
you get bed bound, which is WHO2, these patients tend not to do very well. Now, there is a caveat, of course, because if somebody is bed bound because they had a stroke, um, then that doesn't count. It has to be the um, uh, poor performance status due to the um, uh, neuroendocrine tumour. Now, many of our patients are on long-term somatostatin analogues. Um, there is great debate whether or not this really affects the uptake of the treatment, but most of us feel that um, it's best to not treat the patient within two weeks of an LAR injection. And sometimes we try and, and do it on the day they're getting the LAR injection. We give the PRRT first because it is taken up in the first couple of hours, and then before they go home, we give them their LAR injection. If they're on subcutaneous, if they're able to, we'll ask them to stop for 24 hours. <clears throat> That's subcutaneous octide. Sorry, I wasn't clear there. Now, this is the image I showed yesterday, and this is again shown why Gamma 68 Detatate PET is our favoured agent, because this is a patient who, if we were just relying on the indemocratide, we would say there was no uptake and we wouldn't treat that patient. But if you look at the Gallium 68 Detatate PET, you can see there are multiple um, liver metastases which have uptake at Dota Tate. So this patient would be eligible for treatment. <clears throat> and again, if for those of you who are using the technician Heineck octotide or octotate, again, this is a very good way to, to see the tumor. This is from a patient from Poland. <clears throat> so the first really useful agent was developed in Basel and it was yttrium octotate. As we saw, it has a higher affinity for the somatostatin 2 receptor than octreotide. It has minimal side effects um, as long as you co-administer arginine and lysine to protect the kidneys. And originally, the Basel group didn't do this, and they had a lot of problem with renal failure. But once they started to give this co-administration of amino acids, then they had uh, much better uh, long-term outcomes. Bone marrow uptake is low, but once you protect the kidneys, the bone marrow does become the critical organ. And this was used in Poland, the UK, and Germany for treatment. This is one of the Polish group of patients. The top image here is a Heineck Tate a MIP image from a SPET study showing multiple disease in the upper abdomen and liver. And here's a CT, a couple of slices from the same patient in the arterial phase showing these big multiple liver lesions. This is the um, remstralin after the first treatment, and you can see there is some good uptake in the liver tumor, and this is the bremstralin image after the third image. You can use bremstralin or scatter imaging with yttrium, and you can see there's been a significant reduction in the activity of the tumor. This is uh, another patient. This patient, the images are actually with the uh, Heineck take or Heineck TOC, I think this one case. <clears throat> and again, you can see here we have multiple liver metastases. The CT here with quite a big lesion um, here in the segment four. And then after um, uh, three cycles of the yttrium um, octrotate, you can see there's still some tumor left in the liver but it is reduced, and on the CT scan, that big lesion is slowly being replaced by normal um, liver. So there's um, some studies done. This one was published in um, 2010. 35 patients um, all received um, four cycles, three to four gigabecrals of Y90 uh, dotatate with amino acid cover, 12 weeks apart. So with with lutetium, we didn't do eight weeks, but with yttrium, because it has more toxicity to the bone marrow, it was 12 weeks. Um, and they found a good correlation between symptom relief and survival, but correlation with imaging was less clear. And one of the problems with imaging is that you can use the somatostatin imaging, but the problem with that is if you just clean off some of the tumor, but not tumor that may be somatostatin negative, you don't know that. So you do need to do other imaging and mostly we do CT. And a waterfall plot is a way that you measure um, um, changes between um, your baseline and your post-treatment scan. And the, they measured the biggest five 
lesions and they added that together and looked at the change. So on the left hand one you have the waterfall plot at six weeks and you can see that there's been a reduction in most patients but an increase in two. So these are the two patients that probably aren't going to respond. And there's a dotted line um, which has got PR on it, that's disease progression, sorry, partial response. So that's the formal sort of uh, resist criteria. Now, what is interesting is between the two waterfall plots, no further treatment is given. So these patients have finished their treatment. And then when you rescan them at six months later, you can see that a lot of the patients that weren't uh, responding as much have started to respond a lot more. And below is a single patient. So we have here a, a patient with multiple um, uh, metastases in the liver. After six months after the last treatment, these are reduced. But what is interesting is with no further treatment, by 12 months, then the tumor is completely gone. So we think that this might be due to something called the bystander effect, where what you're doing is damaging the tumor cells and you're allowing the um, body's immune system to then do the rest. <clears throat> so the itrium was very good, but the problem with the itrium was that the um, toxicity to the kidneys remained fairly high. So people started to look for different isotopes, and particularly in Basel and Rotterdam, they were interested in nutrition 177. Um, but they're um, basically... Uh, for about a decade, we were using this, but we didn't have the phase three RCT data, which came along. So the first good paper was published by Eric Krenning in the JCN 2005. 151 patients treated with activities up to 30 gigabecrels of lutetium uh, octretate. As you know, at the moment, uh, that's the standard that we give is 30. So that was up to the standard that we have. Amino acid protection, they did notice that about 2% of patients had some bone marrow toxicity. And interestingly, when you do proper patient-based dosimetry, it's difficult to find a logical reason for that. It seems to be idiosyncratic. And it might actually be metal poisoning from the lutetium because uh, there's quite a lot of non-radioactive lutetium in the preparation. Uh, and in some men, they found a reduction in testosterone and they had follow-up data in about 125 of these patients. And this is what they showed. So they got about 3% of patients which had a cure. Um, then there were about 26% who had a radiological partial response. Then they had a, a group of patients who had not quite a partial response called minimum response. That was about 16. And then they had 35% of patients where the disease didn't change. That's disease stability. And 17 where it got, got worse. <clears throat> and this is one of their patients. And you can see this patient's not cured, but there's been a significant improvement in the fact that they started off with multiple liver mets, and at the end they have um, a significantly reduced number of liver mets. And that's reflected on the lutetium post-therapy scan over the four cycles of treatment. You can see that there's an, a decreasing tumor load. They then went on to do a bigger group. So this 310 patients includes the previous 150, but includes some uh, additional patients. And uh, they describe a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor as a PET. So it's not a PET as in a PET scanner. Or a PET as in um, those people who've got PET giraffes or in PET zebras in their garden, as we discussed earlier. So that's a, that's a joke between some of our colleagues. So mid-gut neuroendocrine tumor, including carcinoid, there was 188 of those. 1% of those had um, complete response, 22 partial response. And then only 20% of them had disease progression. With the pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, both functional and non-functional, um, the results were very similar. Maybe the, the interesting thing is, even though these are more aggressive tumors, they had less disease progressions. <clears throat> so does this matter? Well, if you want to live longer, the answer is no. It doesn't matter whether or not you have stable disease on CT or you have response, you're going to survive very well. The only patients that don't do very well are those who have progressive disease. And partly because we now know that really CT is not a very good measurement because what happens is, is the tumor get re gets replaced by fibrotic tissue, but it looks the same on CT. 
So this is from one of my colleagues. This is from the Royal Free Hospital. Just did they do some nice imaging. So I nicked one of their pictures. And this is a typical post-therapy image where you can see um, uptake. This is with lutetium dotatate in the disease within the liver very nicely. And you can use this also to do your dosimetry. So how do the two agents compare? We did a comparison um, between, in, again, this, is, this was 10 years ago, between the data was then available for the yttrium and for the lutetium. It's not a medicine meta-analysis because it doesn't um, um, include RCTs, but it's what's called tabulated results. And you can see generally that um, we don't really cure anybody, um, a small number of patients with lutetium, but you look at the disease um, progression group, and we know it doesn't matter if you have partial sponsors or disease stability, you're still going to continue to have um, good survival. It was 8% uh, with the dotatate with yttrium and 20% with the dotatate with lutetium. And that just reflects the fact that yttrium is a much more aggressive treatment. But the toxicity was much worse with the yttrium. Um, we had 5% of patients with renal failure and none with lutetium. But the other really important thing is look at the symptom relief column. And again, you're seeing a significant symptom relief. And that's what patients really want. They want to be able to get on with their lives. <clears throat> then there was... Um, uh, Meta-analysis of the phase two papers done in uh, by a Korean group, and they looked at various papers and they identified um, a reasonable number of papers that um, had a prospective arm to them, so they felt it had less bias. Um, they used resist criteria for radiological response, um, and obviously you can see the largest paper was the group from Krenning. And then there was a small paper from Switzerland, the rest were in between. And they did this thing called a forest plot. So a forest plot is how you determine whether or not something is working. And these are the papers uh, that they looked at. Um, in the end, they found four they thought were very useful. And what you're trying to do is see whether or not there is a positive effect of the um, treatment. So as long as, in fact, this is a bit of a funny forest plot because it normally runs out to minus not, um, one at the other side. So anything that is in this area is a positive response. So in disease response rates, there did seem to be a very good response with acceptable toxicity. And in control rates, um, again, there seemed to be a positive response. So overall, the feeling was, was that in the majority of patients, you were getting a very good um, response and it was worth pursuing. There are some cautions um, from uh, a group from Italy looked at patients and found that those patients who were had um, uptake of FDG as well as uh, somatostatin analogs, which is a subgroup of patients, and they tended to be uh, more what we call G2 tumors, which is slightly more aggressive pathology then the disease control was less than in those patients who were FDG negative. And FDG may itself be a marker of patients who are going to have disease progression. And this is um, a couple of curves they produce. So these are the survive, uh, progression-free survival, uh, the top of the FDG negatives, and the red line is the FDG positive. So if you're getting not getting a good result from your PRRT, it might be worth, if you haven't done it, to do an FDG scan. And these patients might do better with a combination of chemotherapy and a PRRT. So the problem we had was that we really need to have a proper phase three trial. Um, and that phase three trial feeds through to lots of information. It enables the uh, governments and insurance companies to work out the cost effectiveness uh, of a treatment. And these days, um, that seems to be very important. Uh, governments don't like spending money, they can avoid it, but they have to spend money if it seems to be a, an effective treatment. <clears throat> so we needed a phase three trial, and the problem is that can't really be done easily by universities. <clears throat> so this is where a company comes in. And this was the um, company called AAA, now part of Novartis. 
and they did a randomized multicenter phase three trial, which was in uh, Australia, the United States and Europe. And um, with agreement with the Americans who seem to be the leaders of the trials, so the FDA were the main organization. They said that they couldn't have patients just on somatostatin because they already progressed. So they said you should double the somatostatin for your control arm and then compare that with dotatate. And we gave the standard um, four administrations of 7.4 gigabecrals. Um, and then with 229 patients included. And overall, there was a reduction in death risk of 79%. Now, these were very early results. I'll show you later results. And overall response, 18% um, in patients with the PRRT versus 3% without. <clears throat> and there were only 13 deaths in the uh, treatment group versus 22 in the control group. Now, interestingly, we did notice there was a, um, a persistent symptom side effect. Uh, the renal toxicity wasn't a problem. But a lot of these patients had nausea. And we thought originally it was the amino acids. But these uh, nausea went on for 10 days. And now we think it's just um, related to the lutetium. Not lutetium that's radioactive, but the non-radioactive lutetium. So this study is called NETA1, and these are the progression-free survival curves. So this is just seeing when patients have progressive disease. And uh, as you can see, by 30 months, there's um, the lutate group still haven't got to 50% progression-free survival. Whilst um, for those who were just taking the somatostat analogs, it was about eight months. So there clearly was an advantage in the treatment with lutate, and we sort of knew that, but now this was proof in a phase three style. And this was published in, um, uh, by Strasberg in the Journal of Clinical Oncology. A fuller set of results was published the following year uh, in um, the New England Journal of Medicine. And uh, these curves are slightly small, so I'm just going to, sh to, to point them out. So this is the progression-free survival. The green line is dotatate, and the black line is the control group. And again, this is just a, a version of the previous curve, which shows that um, by 30 months, uh, the majority of patients with, with dotatate still haven't had any progression. But with the um, just the control arm, that was about eight months. Now, for overall survival, um, they'd only just got to the 50% overall survival within the 30 months of their patients in the control group. But again, as expected, the overall survival of Dota Tate uh, treatment group was very good. And then bottom, they looked at a whole set of um, different factors. Uh, the key 67, the greater the tumor, um, um, where the tumor was, um, whether or not they were male or female, they were old or young. And as long, uh, and not on this forest plot, as long as the, um, this is the median and two standard deviations, as long as it's this side of the line, then it's worth doing. So basically, it didn't matter what kind of tumor you had, the lutate was good for you. Um, the only group that didn't do quite as well were the patients with very heavy a disease load, but it was still better than the control. So overall, this is for if you look at any kind of oncology paper, these are, these are really quite remarkable changes. So we've gone through the these phases and all th three phases we've now done. So this enables us to have confidence in using this technique. So generally, how would we do that? Well, we'd obviously discuss the treatment with the patient. We need to obtain consent, and we would use the data from those trials to give consent about expected side effects, about, about whether or not we expect it to work. Uh, on the day the patient's been treated, um, and many of us now use daycare treatment for patients because it's much easier, we've given antiemetics such as a Dancitron, and then 15 minutes later, we start an amino acid infusion with arginine and lysine. There are various versions available in different countries. <clears throat> and we give about two liters with 30 grams of lysine in over six hours. So 45 minutes after, we've got the amino acids going and this starts the kidney protection. We then give the actual lutetium dotatate over 20 to 30 minutes. And with the lutetium, we normally repeat at eight weeks. 
apart and we do three more treatments. <clears throat> so this is a classical system. So what we have is a, a, a radioactive vial which contains the lutate and then we push uh, saline through it and it washes out the vial and then that goes off to the patient and you can have either two lines in or this one is a system where they have a, a three-way tap so they can um, swap between the amino acids and the lutate tend to stop the amino acids during the lutate infusion because if the patients have symptoms you don't know it's due to the amino acids or the lutate if they get a bit of nausea and that seems to be the main problem you just slow the infusion down a bit so this is what it looks like in reality. So there's a patient, there's the pump. There is the um, lutate in a uh, lead shield in the Perspex box. And um, this is the syringe pumping the, the uh, fluid out and out. And we need about 100 mils of saline to um, uh, clean out the uh, vial. And using this is a very safe method. And our wastages are only about 2%. <clears throat> So if we image the patient um, at multiple time points, so at three hours, what you see is there's still some bladder activity. Um, but by 24 hours, you can see this is a patient who's got liver metastasis. It's all in the liver. And even seven days later, it remains on in the tumor, in the liver. And so you've got both, both targeting and residents, and that helps you to know that you're going to be treating the tumor. It doesn't wash out. Sometimes, for example, MIBG washes out. So can you have um, some problems? Yes. Um, these have been recognized more recently as we've done more patients. In patients with unstable carcinoid, you may get a carcinoid crisis. Uh, and the patient becomes very um, hypotensive, um, tachycardic, uh, sweating a lot, flushing a lot. If that happens, what we would try and do is complete this, the treatment. Normally, the crisis actually occurs in the six hours after treatment, which is why we keep them in for six hours. And once it's in, it sticks, as you see very well. So what we would do, if we need to, would be to set up a somatostatin infusion just to control the, the crisis. And the crisis is due to that, that the fact that the cancer cells are already being broken down. If you have very, very large tumor masses, you can get what's called a child tumor lysis syndrome, which is about three or four days after treatment, they come in with um, pyrexia and they look like they're infected, but they're not. Um, and this should be treated with simple antipyretics. Um, though just to make sure they're not truly infected, you'd normally do some blood cultures. It's always a good idea to try and stop doctors giving antibiotics unless you, they've got proof of infection. And th this lasts for about two to three days and then it settles down. Mainly occurs with big liver mets. Uh, again, this is all very rare. Um, liver failure has been reported in some patients where over 50% of the liver is replaced by tumor. That really reflects poor uh, patient selection. Uh, and these patients nearly always have had previous embolizations of chemotherapy as well, so they're heavily treated patients. Uh, some patients don't handle the amino acid infusion very well and get hyperkalemia. So if patients get some chest discomfort or shortness of breath, you might want to do an ECG. I think that it's around about one in 500 patients have this. And it's slightly more likely if they've got already got pre-existing uh, kidney disease. So if you're concerned, you can always take a blood sample and do an ECG and look for the um, uh, hyperkalemia. And that's, that's treated by classical ways of treating hyperkalemia, for example, with um, calcium, uh, low, low dose calcium infusion. Um, renal impairment seems more common if kidneys obstructed. So if it's a very dodgy kidney, you might want them to put a JJ stent in before you give the PRRT. Uh, as I said before, bone marrow toxicity is not related to um, bone mets or previous chemotherapy. It just seems to be idiosyncratic and may not even be due to radioactivity. So um, this is the, the, the final um, um, results of the NETA-1 trial. So this is looking at any, all events, um, whether or not it be um, death or other things and what happens is that these are patients who've been treated on the trial 
but not had any other treatment. And you see, eventually, it will stop working. And, and we know that because we haven't cured the patient. Uh, none of these patients received a second cycle or a second set of cycles of blue tissue, um, which clearly would change these curves. So eventually, at around about five years after treatment, the treatment group have the same, for example, um, issues as the non-treated group. And the medium overall survival for the lutate um, is four years compared to three years in that control group. But that's because of the way which this was just done as a clinical trial and they didn't get any further treatment. In reality, what you'd be probably doing is a, a two to three years. We found that if you retreat the patient, then you put them back up on a, a longer survival curve. Um, I put the little thing there from Game of Thrones that all men must die. Because the other point is, of course, is that people might also die of un neuroendocrine tumor reasons like heart attacks, strokes, being mauled by their pet rhinoceros or something. Um, so if you do any trial for long enough, you'll find everybody's dead because <clears throat> everybody dies. So in summary, uh, we have increasing evidence of the utility of PRRT, uh, particularly with lutetium dotatate. Uh, I think a general rule is that 80% of patients benefit from PRRT, and we know that progression-free survival can be significantly prolonged. We just need to select the patients a little bit carefully, avoid patients with very aggressive PRR, uh, uh, neuroendocrine tumour and who are FDG positive as well as data tape positive. Or if you are going to treat those patients, maybe do chemo first, then PRRT. Um, PRRT data helps to convince oncologists to refer patients and shows cost effectiveness, which is, um, I think it's now been done with the long-term follow-up patient groups. So, we have come to an end.